Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm glad to be here to talk about this. So I, like, like any good former theoretician will tell you, I put the word towards in there so that whatever I tell you, you can't <laughs> say I didn't deliver, as promised, because only towards. Um, uh, I also, since I said theory or theories, you can't complain if I tell you too many things and confuse you, because I, I didn't promise it either. So I'm being very careful in what I'm willing to promise. So, but having said that, I was looking over you know, some of the previous colloquium that you've had here, and, and I will assure you up front, this will be somewhat different to the ones you're used to. But I do hope that it will be uh, thought-provoking in the most literal of senses, that it will provoke you to have many thoughts. <laughs> Hopefully many of them that you will share with me during the talk, so I can talk less and you can talk more. That's uh, always a good move for a speaker. So I guess the reason I'm here today and the reason that you know, I have to convince reporters not to ask me about killer robots all the time is because of, the, because of essentially this. This is, my, this is my one picture that I showed to lawyers to say this is what machine learning is, and they're very happy they don't want to hear anymore. So this is machine learning. You have inputs coming in, and you do something, and you make a decision. And that very simple idea of that you can train something to classify is at the heart of many, many uh, as I say, deployments of algorithms in the world around us, in places that you may or may not have even realized are being deployed. So there are obvious things like you, know, you, want, to be, you want to get into college, Colleges are actually doing or starting to do some kind of data analysis on the applicants coming in to figure out things like, will they be a debt burden? Will they drop out after three years and waste all their money? Will they go on to success and riches and, and as alumni donate money to our endowment or things like that? They actually do look at these kinds of factors when they start deciding admissions. And again, you may know this already. You probably have heard, okay, there's no news that you know, people use credit, we use credit scores to decide whether someone's a credit worthy risk. But what you may not know is that there's even more micro-targeting that's happening right now where if you're a small business, a bank might ask one of these third-party vendors to go look at your Yelp profile to see who's been complaining about your business or who's not been, and look at your social media pages. Are you on Facebook? Do you have pictures of you drunk on Facebook? Does that mean you're a credit risk or not? Whether they think so or not, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, and then use that as a basis for deciding whether to give you a loan or not. So it's not just a simple credit risk type thing you used to have. Um, the, in hiring, so disclaimer, I'm uh, sort of uh, on the scientific advisory board for one of these companies, HireVue, which is based in Salt Lake City. Um, there are companies that will do various kinds of online hiring. So a company will want to hire you know, a bunch of new receptionists. They'll go to one of these companies and say, we want to do a lot of hiring. The company will organize like an online interview panel. You'll go sit in front of a screen on your laptop you know, and uh, answer questions. Some of the more sophisticated versions of these systems will actually analyze your, your video, analyze whether you're smiling too much or too little, and whether your, your lips twitch or not, and you have micro gestures that might suggest that you're laughing at the company or you're not lying or something else. There's a whole panoply of things, how you talk, what the register of your voice is, to try and model whether you're going to be a good fit for the job you're applying for. Um, of course, there's, you know, this is being recorded, you said, right? So Yes. I will say nothing now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There are many places where you know uh, there was this whole push a while back to dis dis to come up with a machine learning algorithm to decide who would be a good immigrant to decide who should be allowed into the country. Uh, I, I'm very happy to say that a number of people uh, sort of pushed back very loudly and said we're not going to have anything to do with this. And uh, last I was heard, they decided to back off from building an automated system and are still using a human system to do the same thing, which is not much of a solution, but it's still something. And um, Probably most seriously of all, the, uh, where something that you know, I've been involved with quite a bit is in criminal justice, right? So whether, you know, whether to decide whether police should show up in a neighborhood or not, whether you are arrested and given bail or not, whether you're sent to, to jail before a trial or not, whether you're sent, what kind of sentence you're given, uh, whether you're given a sentence or not, whether you're allowed to be released on parole, all of these systems are now being mediated in some form by algorithms of some kind, okay? And again, this is far more prevalent than you might realize it is. And of course, when you start having these systems deployed in such a widespread manner across all these different domains, you start realizing that you know, these systems are not just training data, they're not just making decisions about data, they're well, making decisions about people too. Some of you may get this joke, many of you may not. <laughs> And of course now we, and, and, you know, and this is basically on a weekly basis, you can start seeing examples of the sort of accidental and less accidental problems when algorithms take over decision making, right? So, um, and I should say that the, the reason, the reasons given for the deployment of algorithms are many fold. Among them include efficiency. 
You can, you can do a risk assessment on 100,000 people in the same time it used to take you to do a risk assessment on 10 people. So efficiency is a good thing. You can capture data from people's Twitter profiles and Facebook profiles. If you're coming into the US now, you, you, there's a pilot program to ask you to give your social media info so customs can actually see what you've been saying about the government on Twitter. <laughs> I will never leave the country again. So, um, uh, and, um, all, uh, so that's the second aspect. Integrate different data sources to build a good model for how people are thinking. The third is, paradoxically enough, the claim that that our algorithms are less subjective than humans, that humans have biases of various kinds, and algorithms are free of those biases. I think it's very clear that efficiency is a big win, and in most cases, this is the major compelling point. It's cheaper, it's easier to use algorithms. The rest of it, well, this is what we know. So for example, the famous study from ProPublica a few years ago about, how, uh, about biases in the way predictions are being done for recidivism. In other words, checking whether people reoffend once they reach some parole. Um, of course, we've been hearing a lot about this. Facebook is in a fair bit of serious legal trouble now because of allowing advertisers to target people based on race. This is illegal by sort of fair housing laws and, and things like that. And of course, you probably have heard something about this. And again, um, this is not to you know uh, uh, this is not to imply that China is the only country doing this. I think you know in the U.S. there's an attempt to do some things like this as well. But I think the idea that you can build some kind of credit system that predicts human behavior and sort of regulates human behavior is something that we're seeing happen right now. And um, you know, depending on how you think about it, this is somewhat scary. And of course, I could go on with a few more articles, but I don't have to because we've got a whole bunch of books on this now. And if, you're, if you really want to be depressed about the role of algorithms, you can read any of these books. They're all quite satisfyingly depressing. So, <laughs> so the, thing is, the thing is this. I mean, it is, there are people who will argue that we should never ever use any kind of automated process to do decision making. I think, first of all, that ship has sailed and it's unlikely to work in any, in any case. I think what we can hope for as computer scientists, as people who build these systems, is to understand the ways in which these systems may be falling short of the ideals of where, the way we deployed them, especially when it regards things like fairness, non-discrimination, notions that I want to talk about some more in the rest of this talk. But of course, these are algorithms. They are trained models. They're trained from data. As I like to tell people outside CS, algorithms speak math. If you want to express societally desirable goals like fairness and, and lack of bias, you have to express it in the language that the algorithms understand, the language of mathematics. And so what I want to do now is sort of move very quickly into how we have been and how we might go about defining notions like fairness and non-discrimination and what that eventually ends up meaning for um, how we build these systems. Okay, and like I said, feel free to interrupt at any point with questions and clarifications. Hi, Piotr. <laughs> so, I've known Piotr a long time. <laughs> okay, um, all right, some definitions. So to start, you know, this is where, you know, so, so again, when I, when I talk to lawyers, I put up one slide with a little bit of math and they all get very scared and, like, <gasps> and I have to warn them there'll be no more. I think for this audience, don't worry, some math's actually coming, so. <laughs> so. Let's think, let's, let's, as an abstraction, let's take a very simple decision task, right? So you have some space of inputs, and you have some decision procedure that maps the, an input to an element of the space of outcomes, right? So in the simplest possible case, the space of outcomes is true or false, zero or one, yes and no. The space of inputs is a feature vector, a set of feature vectors describing people, right? So this is a very, very simple example. And there, you could, of course, make this more complicated, but that's not. How would we go about defining a notion of fairness? And again, this word is a loaded term, right? So I'll try to sort of explain different ways in which this word manifests itself in, the, in popular imagination. The simplest way, not the simplest, I guess, but a, a, a natural way one can think about the idea of fairness is in a procedural form. In other words, you want a process to work sort of consistently and fairly in some sense. And this leads us to a definition which now we're calling individual fairness. And it looks something like this. So again, you have inputs and you have some function mapping the outputs. The idea of individual fairness is the following. If I have two inputs that are similar to each other, so the right-hand side, that small d, is measuring a distance between two things, x and x prime, and you say that they're somehow similar with respect to some task. Okay, all of this is gonna be with respect to a task. I'm not talking about a universal notion here. Then the goal of individual fairness to say, look, if two individuals are similar with respect to a task, their treatment should also be similar. Specifically, if you think of the action on these items as f of x or f of x prime, 
then there should be there's some other distance function which compares f of x and fx prime with the property, this Lipschitz-like property, that this distance should be less than the original distance. It should not be more. So inputs that are very similar should be treated similarly. Inputs that are very far apart, I have a much larger wiggle room in how I treat them. Okay? Why do you say this is procedural? This is functional to me. We don't care about the process, we care about themselves. Um, I guess I call it procedural because it's, it's emphasizing that people go through the process in the same way in some sense. That if you look similar to someone else, you go through the same trajectory and get to the same place as the other person. Um, at, at least in the, um, in the law, th there's a distinguishing between fairness based on procedure and fairness based on outcome. And I think that's why I've been using that word procedural. It's not a formal term, so I'm happy to replace it by functional or, or anything if you want. And for technical reasons, uh, it'll be more convenient to think of this as a randomized operation. So this is really mapping to the set of, uh, to the set of distributions over the outcomes. So there may be a probabilistic sort of answer. With some probability, you hit this outcome or that outcome, okay? Uh, once you do that, you get to this notion. This was first formalized by, by Dwork et al. in 2012 in an ITCS paper. And this is what they were calling individual fairness. The paper was called Fairness Through Awareness. And, okay. um, once you have that, of course, you know, it's very easy to be fair in the sense that you can just give everyone the same outcome. This will satisfy all of these constraints. And of course, that's not all the whole picture. In all of these problems, there is some goal you're trying to s satisfy. You're trying, you're trying to solve some learning problem. You're trying to be efficient as well. You're trying to be accurate. So in all of these cases, just like with privacy, we talk about this trade-off between utility and privacy. Here, there's this notion of sort of the accuracy of the, of the function f. So let's say you have some kind of loss function. Right? And you have some measure of loss. And so what you want to do is minimize the, the overall loss over an input and sort of an output taken from the distribution of outcomes with the constraint that you want to search only over the space of fair functions, where I just defined what fair means. Right? And again, uh, this is a, it's a sort of a, a nice paper that shows that, among other things, if D is defined as statistical distance, the total variation distance, then you can solve this in polynomial time under certain conditions. Um, I actually won't be spending too much time talking about actual complexity bonds because for me, the, at least in this talk, the definitions are going to be the key, but I just want to mention that here. So this is the kind of flavor of the result you have. You have a notion of fairness and you have some notion of an accuracy and you want to build some system that does a good job where you search only over the space of fair things. Right? So this is the definition of fairness. Okay. But this notion of fairness, it captures, like I said, what you can think of as a procedural notion that individuals that are similar should be treated similarly. There is a whole other dimension to fairness, which by my right, by my notion should not even be called fairness, but just because people have been calling it that is the ring. It's more what I would call non-discrimination. And it, it captures a different aesthetic about how we think about justice. So what is group fairness? This is the notion I'm going to describe here. So first of all, of course, to define group fairness, I need to define what a group is. So imagine that you have your input space and it's been partitioned into groups. Okay, so this is a partition. And there's some you know, function g that tells you what the group label for an individual is. For simple, uh, you, know, you can think of a group label as, say, a racial label or a gender label or some kind of age label or whatever you want. It's some kind of label where the label is something that you want to make sure you are protected under, that some kind of decisions are not made that pay too much attention to this label. But in the past, they have, so we're worried about it. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. So, I mean, someone has to come up with the distance. I'll get to that in a second, but you're right. Uh, I, I have not told you where that magic D comes from, but we'll talk about that in a, in a minute or two. Very, yeah, that's a good, good, good catch. Yeah. So for, for now, just pretend there are two groups, and there's a majority group, which is considered not, not in terms of the numbers, but in terms of the group that is not, that is privileged in some sense, which is uh, we'll call the unprotected group, where we'll say gx equal to one, just for convention, and the minority group, which is protected, where g of x equal to zero, okay? So once you have this basic setup, what does a group fairness definition look like? So it turns out there's a whole family of them. And the basic aesthetic, the idea you want, is that you want the outcome to not have to depend on the group label. Right? So if I'm trying to hire people for a job or give them a loan, I would like for my decision not to depend on which group they belong to, because that's what I'm concerned about here. I don't want discrimination. So you can define it in this manner. So if you look at the top line, what I'm basically saying is that you want these two probabilities of fx equal to one conditioned on gx equal to one to look like the probability fx equal to one, the good outcome, let's say. Let's say you have a very simple case where you have two outcomes. There's a good and a bad outcome. You want the good outcomes to look similar for both groups. We actually right now don't care about the bad outcomes. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. 
And so the easiest and probably the oldest, um, at least in our literature, the definition, this goes back actually to 2007. There's a whole list of papers, which I didn't want to list all of them. There's a paper by Pedersi and Ruggieri from 2007 that first formulates this idea that, you, for example, want to make sure the difference in the probabilities is not too large. Right? So you have the two probabilities, you want to make them not too large. Um, this actually, um, the, in, some, in one version of this was used in, this has been used in the United Kingdom in, uh, in, in terms of measuring gender discrimination, but it's, you know, it's just a, a sort of a very natural notion. Another way to, of course, encode the idea of the two probably similar is to take some kind of ratio. So, okay, I want these two ratios to be, you know, reasonably close to each other. So I want this, you know, notice that it's, it's not symmetric. I have an explicit privilege for the, mi well, uh, benefit for the minority group saying I want this ratio to be greater than or equal to one minus epsilon. And this actually, there's an interesting story behind this because this is part of what is called the doctrine of disparate impact. This itself is not a disparate impact measure, but it's part of what is called a doctrine of disparate impact, which was enshrined in a Supreme Court case in the 70s. And that's a very important case for all of the work that I and others do because it was the first case that laid out the idea that discrimination can be captured by looking at the outcomes and not at intent. So most standard notions of direct discrimination involve someone sort of cackling sort of evilly and looking at you and saying, I am not going to hire you, ha, 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 that kind of thing. This is a much more neutral version of that, where it says, I don't, I don't need to know that the intent was present. All I need to know that the outcome was disparate in some sense to have a potential case of discrimination, not a confirmed case, but a potential case of discrimination. This is very important because algorithms cannot express intent. And so if you didn't have that, there would be no way of saying that an algorithm can have a bias at all. As a side note, every year I look at the Supreme Court docket and wonder whether this is the year my research agenda will die, because there's always some case on the Supreme Court which if decided the wrong way will just make all of this moot. So it's kind of like a not exciting way to live. So, <laughs> um, so in, the, in, the, in the legal parlance, this setting is often used as epsilon equal to 0.2, which is called the 80% rule, because if you set that, you get 0.8. So if you hear about the 80% rule, this is what they're referring to. The ratio of the positive outcomes should be no less than 80%. Why 80%? I don't know. It just happened to be a number that worked in one court case and then for precedent got set. There's no particular reason for this. But you can think of this as something that should be small. Right? You want epsilon should be a small number here. Okay. So we've seen now two different categories of definitions. One which I was calling, sort of, well, which is called individual fairness and one which is sort of generally talking about group fairness. There is another notion which looks at something slightly different. It says, it is not that I want to balance the successful outcomes for the groups. It is that I want to make sure that my errors are distributed equally across groups. So this became a particularly important issue in that ProPublica um, story, and I'll mention that briefly later on. But it's a slightly different statement. It's not saying that the groups have to be sort of hired at the same rate. It's saying that if I make mistakes, I should do so consistently. I shouldn't, for example, be more willing to make f have false positives with one group and be much less willing to have false positives with a different group. Right, so this, this sort of aphorism about having to work twice as hard to get the same achievement is kind of trying, this is trying to capture that that should not happen. And again, you can define this formally. This was first formally sort of described in a, a paper by Hart, uh, Price, and Shrebo from 2016, also in a paper by Zafar et al. sort of around about the same time, which I should have mentioned as well. And so again, for this, you need a bit more jargon. You need a bit more, you need to know what the true outcome is, right? You're, you're defining with respect to false positives and false negatives. So you also need to know what the ground truth is. So once you have that, you're basically saying, okay, this is one way of saying this. The probability of an error should look the same which, depending on which group you're in. And of course, there are variations on this. You can talk about, you want to match the false positives, you want to match the false negatives, or you want to match some combination of these things. You can play various games like that. But this is the, this is the difference, though, that you're looking at error rates, not at actual outcomes. Okay. And um, as I actually just discovered, there's, another, there's a nice paper from 2017 uh, which sort of tries to abstract out all these, these couple of formulations into a more general form that basically says that, look, what I really want is that the outcome should be independent of this attribute, potentially conditioned on some third variable here. And this is a way to capture these different notions here. Uh, and this can be generalized to allow for some kind of approximate independence as well. So you can make a more robust notion of this. And if any of you were at the Fat Star Conference in New York this year, you may have attended a tutorial called this. So there's quite a number of definitions now at this point, <laughs> depending on how you define these things. Most of them are in this group fairness sort of setting, and they have different ways of thinking about how to balance our group fairness. Okay. 
So what do we do with all these definitions, right? Because you know, we want to build algorithms, we want to sort of build tools. We don't, we don't want to have you know, all these different things sort of floating around. And I think the, the title of that tutorial was not by accident. 21 Fairness Definitions and Their Politics. The, what I want to present to you now is an argument as to why it seems like there are going to be intrinsic differences between these definitions that can't be easily combined. And this is sort of a theme that I see a lot in the work in fairness, which is something that one has to be careful about. And it's the following problem. We, we define things. We, make not, you know, we define a concept. We try to make it as precise as possible, and we try to prove things about it. And we don't necessarily think of our definitions as carrying any normative weight on them, any kind of ethical stance or any kind of moral stance on them. But it turns out if you look at these definitions very carefully, they do, in fact, carry with them some st implicit statements or beliefs about how the world appears to look for the purpose of using the definition. And that's a tricky situation to be in because what we'd like to do ideally is separate out our own ideologies and viewpoints about the world and about justice and fairness from the definitions we pick. We want to have some nice separation of concerns. We can say, look, you, know, you and I might disagree on what we think is just or not, but here's a definition we can all agree on. And the, the important thing, and this is not just true in the, in the examples I'm going to give you here, in a lot of work on fairness, subtle choices of how you make definitions actually represent choices about how you see the world. And it's important to make that explicit. So I'm going to do that right now. And, then, and we'll see, hopefully, what the implications of this are. And as I promised in the abstract, there are going to be two things that come out of this. On the one hand, we will see how normative concerns have leached into these definitions in ways in which we didn't expect. On the other hand, the value of these definitions is that they actually send messages back to the world saying, if you want to do this, you can't do it this way, and you can't do it that way. And this is how you have to look at defining your, defining your notions. And I think that's definitely something of value that, as computer scientists, theoreticians also, we can provide. So there's a bit of hope to this well. All right. So I start with definitions, and now I'm going to throw in some beliefs in this. If you've been, you know, and I'm, I'm surprised at this point, no one has already started arguing me. And usually when I give these definitions, people start complaining about how the definitions don't make any sense. But maybe you're already thinking that. But let me try to tell you why, why I think these definitions may not make a lot of sense. And we'll take them one by one. So let's look at the group fairness definitions first. Right? So this is the stylized picture of sort of different groups sort of being pushed together by some kind of group fairness criteria, which is essentially what you should think of as happening here. One of the problems with this definition, right, or if you think about it, a potential problem with this definition is that it is making a strong assumption about how group abilities are distributed. What it's basically saying is that we believe, when we use this definition, that there's no good reason for groups to be treated differently. That any attempt to treat groups differently is because of some bias of some kind. The implicit assumption being that if, we, if it weren't for that bias, we would expect to see the same outcomes for different groups. That is a, a strong assumption. And again, you, know, you may or may not agree in any particular task where this is reasonable. Nevertheless, it is still an assumption. Right? So the group fairness notion, it forces group outcomes together, regardless of whether groups are fit for the task. Right, if, it, if it so happens that you're, you're running some kind of uh, test for students in two schools, and the students in one school just happen to be a lot better at the task than the other, a criteria that says that I shouldn't distinguish among schools in, different, in the same district will force, their, will force me to sort of build a test that makes them all sort of look indistinguishable, even if the students in one group are actually a lot better. Right? You, you could still ask that the rate of mistakes for two groups would be similar. You could. When, when the groups are not necessarily equal. That's right, and that, that's an interesting discussion, and we will, we'll, I hope to start talking about it a bit more. You're absolutely right there, absolutely, yes. But this is a, a sort of an assumption that is baked into this definition. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense, right? Why on earth should I try to make sure the groups have the same outcome? Okay? So this is one issue with group fairness. And, and this is, again, like I said, no matter how much you might believe that this is true, that should not be the reason to, def to come up with a definition. The definition should be free of those kinds of, if, as, as far as possible, free of your own sort of opinions about what the world should look like. So let's look at individual fairness. So as uh, was already pointed out, individual Actually, fairness. You, you've said, you, oh. keep saying that, um, you keep saying that we should have these definitions that uh, are free of individual bias, or it sounded like free of normative yep. concerns. And, um, 
good. That's yes. confusing. Tell okay, me, good, good, good. Uh, Tell me why it's confusing. I'm sort of surprised you said it because you really you seem to want to account, you want to include some set of normative concerns but not others. Ah, good. And so maybe you could say which ones you want, you think is legitimate to include and which ones you think. So in my ideal world, we start off by setting out the normative concerns we have and then say, based on these concerns, these are the definitions that are consistent with those concerns. These are definitions that are inconsistent with those concerns. And we want a clear connection between the normative concerns and the definitions. If we don't separate them out, then they're entangled in a way that it's hard to make sense. So when I say I want it to be free, I don't mean I want to ignore it. I want, to, to, I, I want, to, I want to factorize them out nicely, Got it. Okay. to use the right term. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in your high school test example, wait, could, could, could you clarify that? And then I'll have a point after you. Um, so OK, so, so the, this is a bad example I was giving. Because if I give a real example, it, it, I'm on video and it'll oh, just look bad. So, I'll give you a, so this is a fake example. <laughs> so the fake example is right that I have two schools, and I'm running some kind of district level test. Okay. Yeah, my son just went through this. This is the example that popped into my head. So there's some district level tests for students in schools. And you suddenly discover that students from one school are doing way better than other tests than students from other school. And you're worried about this because you feel like students in all schools should have the same opportunity or should be able to sort of do well and this is reflecting some problem in the way the teaching is happening. So you have to somehow do something with the scores or something else to make sure they look the same. But this ignores the fact that in fact maybe just so happened that students in one school are way better than the students in the other school. Okay, so in that story there isn't actually a classification problem that, that you're doing based on this. But if there was, couldn't you just, so G is basically any surjection that captures like what you want to protect, like the variables you want to protect, right? Why can't that just map to a not of which school you're in, but of like average school performance or something. So it, in other words, it, it's the G that encodes what you want to protect. So that in this case, the G is the school identifier. Exactly, but right. I'm saying that, that the concerns you're raising could be uh, addressed by changing the G to, sure. to, to just map to whatever you do care about. Ah, but, the, but usually in these settings, G is not fungible. I G is the thing okay. you're worried about. Okay, so you can say that fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's usually the fixed thing that you're worried about. If you're worried about race-based discrimination, you're worried about race-based discrimination. Yeah, you can't, but, uh, but yeah, mm, okay. All right, so um, what about individual fairness? So as already was pointed out, there's this sort of, there's this magic thing at the heart of individual fairness, this idea that we can determine the true similarity between uh, individuals, and that once we have that, we can do what we have to do. Now this has been a sort of a critique of this, of this notion that has been raised you know, since it first came out. And I think and, you know, the, the, the people who sort of have s talked about this measure have talked about ways in which you could try to get access to D. Maybe you do some kind of sampling. Maybe you go and ask people. You do some clever testing and so on. But I would argue that there is a deeper sort of issue carrying, carried along with this definition, namely the following. right? So there is this notion of structural bias, the idea that, that bias towards groups is rooted sort of in institutional sort of structures, right? That are that are running at normal operation. Okay, so normal. So for example, the uh, examples are sort of if you look if you look at the history of of housing discrimination and loans, an entire system of very normal looking decision making was set up, precisely to discriminate against certain communities back in the day, right? And some of this the legacy still lives with us still today, and so. If you assume that there is some distance function that you can get access to that you can then use to build an individually fair measure, what you're basically saying is that you are able to generate appropriate information from individuals that reflects their true worth for the task somehow. Right? That there is no interference from institutional structures from society in any way that prevents you from getting this information. Either that or you just don't care about it. But the point is that it assumes that you have that information, that somehow by working hard enough, you can get that. And this is sort of a somewhat contested fact. Again, if you, depending on who you ask, there will be some people will say there is no easy way to get access to true worth in a system where there's structural bias of various kinds. So again, this is not to say that you should not use individual fairness as a notion. It's just that it carries with it this assumption that you are able to get access to true worth of some kind. And that may not always be the case, depending on your problem. If you could get access to your work, couldn't you be fair? Well, the question is, can you, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, I guess, if, yeah. If you, doesn't that sound, is that, is accessing me the whole problem? Um, if you could ac get access to true work, then you could solve everything in, in principle, if you framed it that way. The, but the, if you could ac get access to true worth, is a very, 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 very strong assumption well, to make about any system. But that's the real procedural versus substantive fairness. Yeah. 
in this problem is that you never can, or not you never can, but it's very, very hard. Yeah. So you rely on procedure because you can't get yeah. the substance. You hope the procedure reveals substance right. somehow, but it's hard to do it reliably uh, uh, up front. What he says. What you're hoping is that capital B is an approximation to little b? No. no that you're hoping that you have a good characterization of little d. Capital D, so you can pick yourself, right? Some kind of statistical distance or whatever you want. Little d is the description of the world, so is the oracle. This describes the world you live in, right? Well, yeah. I think when you use the word dwarf, you like this, this is one number. That's mm -hmm. how dwarf yeah, you yeah. are, which I don't think is what you mean. What you mean is that if you were able to estimate which qualities of a person are you know, important for the, impactful for the task, and which, which one are, are not. Not only which ones are impactful, but that they're measured correctly. Yes, no, but like, mm. yeah, but worth such that there's one number. I think you were just saying that correct. you were able to, uh, like. Construct the correct set of. It's one number, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. we do it the other way, because if you look at what we do, what we tend to say is there's certain uh, qualities that we will not consider. In other words, we don't know all the qualities. We can't enumerate all the aspects of any individual's worth. But we can't take off the table certain qualities with, with race, gender, et cetera, which we've decided just you just can't consider. Right. Does that make this a different, does that change this? That doesn't work. <laughs> so this is what is uh, what people often call in the literature fairness through blindness. So the idea is that you are blind to these features. And this doesn't work because of correlations, because of sort of ancillary attributes that correlate. For example, I take away your race, I keep your name. <laughs> That often gives me a signal that, that a clever machine learning algorithm might be able to pick up on. Or I take away your race, I keep your zip code. Segregated neighborhoods, this also gives me, or I keep your income level, or I keep other things, or a combination of factors. So it's very hard to just take away features that you explicitly don't want to um, uh, discriminate based on, and then hope that this solves your problem. Yeah, I think what Danny was saying, Sorry, yeah. uh, like kind of if you just said that instead of like figuring out what are the features that are impactful, yeah. you somehow magically, and again, aware of this right. issues, if you believe that you can just not rely on the things you should not rely, would it like, do you think this would be something different? Or like, do you think it's the same point? So, sorry, you wanna? Uh, 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 so, so I guess, personally, in some cases, you could have a very objective, clear notion of the and you know, in really You could. And you know, chances of survival in the real reality versus like 3.1. This, you know, the real facts that you cannot argue about. And that's exactly my point. It's not that you can't. It's that you have to be. Able, you have to somehow. I w maybe assume is the right word. You have to be able to defend the assumption that you can. And that's all I'm saying. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, not maybe, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why you are concerned about the fact that there are 21 motions and there are four I'm not. I just mentioned that because of, yeah. One would be naive to assume that there is one motion that captures this complex uh, concept. You said that, but three people today have asked me, is there a good single notion of fairness I can take away from your talk? So, so I mean, but you, but you said it'd be naive to assume that, but I think there's a sense that we would like that. But I don't want to steal, you know, Suresh stuff, but it's more than that. It's not only that there are different notions of fairness, they are actually incompatible. Yes, yeah, and I'm going to get to that in a bit. Yeah. D, so okay, l l let me clarify, good. So small d is your description of the universe, is, is, a, is a way to model the world, which is given to you by an oracle somewhere. And that's the problem case. We have to know it to make this definition work, and we have no way to compute it. D is just a distributional distance, you can pick whatever you feel like. Well, I, I mm. think that is, I think Bobby were both right, but like, so, you know, technically this is now going into the proof, like you might be able to prove it, without being able to evaluate. A no, no, but I'm not even sure what you're trying to prove when you say prove prove what. Like meaning you want to say claim my mechanism enforces this, you know, like let's say there is, like there are two questions, yes, like do you believe there exists D? Yeah. And the second thing is, can, do you think that we as humans can construct D? These are two different things. Yes. You could imagine that it might be still true that you are not able to, as a human to construct D, but there is uh, somewhere D out there, like you know, the God knows what is the right D, and somehow you're able to prove that your mechanism is preserving this D, mm -hmm. even though you, you can't exactly pinpoint what it is, right? So these are sure, and I, I think I'm going to get to some of these things in okay. a bit. So let's let's just keep going. Yeah, yeah. In terms of how to think about these notions. So it turns out that again, trying to talk about this, 
is there's somewhat of a vocabulary problem. And uh, this has been sort of a vocabulary problem for a couple of years, and so which forced us to try and... Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry but like, I think if you don't believe that there is such a measure, then like, isn't like, like again, I totally, I guess this goes into my beliefs. I totally am willing to believe that we humans are flawed and we will never be able to get this little d. But like, if you don't believe that there exists a d, then like, doesn't this undermine the whole notion of fairness or something? No, no, because so, so this is another paper that I've been writing that I won't talk about here, but um, you can, it is perfectly consistent to say, we cannot access a D, there is no single D, but there are different Ds that capture the agendas of different entities who are all stakeholders in this decision. I see. Okay. So, so, so and you have to, and then depending on, and there's a sort of a, not to get too sort of Marxist on you, but there's a, there's a, there's a different power structure, the, depending on the power structure involved in who's making the decisions, different Ds will play an more or less important role at different points in time. Hmm. Sorry, I talked to Tony Soshi all this like, what is happening? But there is such a, uh, it's interesting, you will learn of literature in the law, ethics, uh, 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 literature, about is this notion empty? And the people of it's empty because, you know, how do we decide when people are equal? Well, by how you treat them, that's what decides how they're equal, so it's a circular notion that makes no sense. There's a whole literature about... No. So if uh, those of you who want to follow up on this, so Deborah Hellman, who's a philosopher, uh, sort of a justice philosopher at University of Virginia gave a wonderful keynote at the at the Fat Star conference in New York last year, where she talked exactly about this point. If you treat these notions philosophically, what does it even mean? And this idea of circularity sort of comes up in our discussion as well. So, so I, I will say, just in the interest of going on, I will say, sort of, go look at Deborah Hellman's thing, and um, Piotr is telling me to hurry up. <laughs> so, okay. So yeah. So uh, yeah. And then you can direct any questions to you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So th th there's a there's a. What we came across is the idea there's a vocabulary problem here. There's a vocabulary problem in the way people are talking almost across purposes about how these different definitions work. And what we have is an attempt to sort of clean up this, this vocabulary problem. So if nothing else, hopefully that this is something that helps you sort of think about these things in a more sort of systematic way. We've talked about sort of how the process of making decision works. You have some kind of feature space, you have a function that maps it to the decision space. And this is how pretty much all of machine learning and sort of data science generally works. You have a feature space, just been you're done. The problem is that in almost all situations, especially the more sort of socially relevant situations we look at, there is something else going on. There is an, what we'll call an unobserved construct, construct space. There is a space of sort of, uh, so the word construct I borrow from the psychology literature. So these are, I, I don't want to call them, I used to call them ideal features, but they're not really ideal. They're the constructs we think about when we want to build our predictive tool. And there's the actual things we observe, which is on the right side. Similarly, there's the things we want to decide and there's what we actually end up deciding. The problem is, of course, everything on the left is something you don't actually get to see. And that's a challenge here. So with, when you want to define something like fairness, what you're really saying is that I have the ideal or the construct feature space, the ideal decisions I want, and I want to define something called fairness in that space. I don't have access to it. I have access to what I can measure, and I define some mechanism to achieve fairness there. And my hope is that these two things are the same. That's the goal in all the things we're playing. At. Okay. And this is very important, and I'll give you an example to sort of illustrate this point. So let's look at a particular example of this in the case of recidivism prediction. So recidivism is, again, the problem of deciding when you release someone on parole whether they will reoffend. If it, and in many states, the rule is that if you can decide that someone's going to reoffend, you may change the terms of the parole, you may not release them on parole. It depends on how, uh, how you think about this. So let's look at this example. What does this mean for how these tools are built in this context? So the, 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 what you're looking for are sort of propensity for crime, level of risk aversion, access to opportunity. These are things you want to capture as a way to predict whether someone is going to re-offend after being released. What you actually can observe are things like family history of crime, age, prior record. These are features that are typically used in, uh, in, in these kind of prediction tools. So that's what you observe. That's what you're trying to get at. Similarly, what you want, you know, well, well what you, well, let me go ahead. What you want is to predict the risk of recidivism and violent or nonviolent crime and the different ways of doing these things. What you end up collecting as data for your training is things like likelihood of rearrest or parole violations. And so I want to give this example to show you how, even though these notions may be similar, what you're trying to predict is on the left side, what you're actually measuring and predicting is on the right side. And it is the Differences between these things, if they exist, is where the definitions of fairness and non-discrimination appear from. Does it matter, do you think, that the things on the left side are not just unmeasurable, but probably not knowable? 
except by an absolute you know, deity. But this goes to the point of whether you can ever find this D, right? I mean, this goes to that basic point, right? I mean, this is how these questions are framed. Like, but, it's, but I mean, my point is, it's not just a question of trying to do better at the left side. It's you can't really do anything about the left side. If like you, say you're hiring someone, you say, you're going to be a good person for the job. Well, you just really don't know in, in the individual case. You're going to find out because the few, there are all sorts of contingencies in the future that are simply not knowable. So there's a, there's a school of thinking. And again, I'll limit myself to the, the criminal justice example here. There's a school of thinking that any kind of risk assessment tool is invalid and fraught with errors for exactly yeah, what you said. Right. Not everyone believes that. So, but, but, but you're right. There is definitely people who believe that the entire carceral state is, is, should be taken down, essentially. <laughs> and I've had arguments with people like that. And, and for, because you cannot do this kind of thing. So There's no way to know these things. That's the basics of legal justice, right? That's the whole, this is the whole basis of legal justice. You do some procedure, you approximate something, you know, that God only God knows, but we have only way of doing something. And this is how people have justified these notions in the past, yeah. We have to live, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. This question seems to implicitly assume that uh, the way you get the decision is to go from the feature space to the to these other states and yeah. then do the right thing in some sense. Yeah. But maybe there's another well, way of doing yeah. things which don't have to kind of reconstruct this apparent, you know, like, uh, you know, right. but actually don't exist. Right, right, right. And, right. Actually, the question I'm getting at is not the, you know, epistemological question of what's knowable there, but just the right. question of how we should think about the right side given the unknowability. So there's one way, one way to think about this as yes, there is an unknowability. There is a degree to which we can, we can attempt to approximate, while fully recognizing that approximations are always going to be just that, approximations, which might give us some caution in how we use the tools. <laughs> and maybe may, may make us feel not so certain about how we use them. So that, these are all important considerations, but you don't get to that till you realize this in the first place. And that's why I said this was fundamentally a vocabulary problem. But I want to argue something a bit more than that. I mean, and this is sort of a more of a, I, I jokingly call it category theory, but it's not really, but it's more like the point of framing the question in this diagram with these four pictures um, is to say that if we want to formalize notions of fairness, or non-discrimination, or structural bias, or what have you. We should do that by quantifying the maps that occur across these four things. And that is a reasonable way to think about this. And that does allow us to recover and reveal hidden contradictions and other ways in how these measures are thought about. So, so this is the, so the, the thesis, I guess, of the rest of this talk is basically this. That we, we can, once we think about these different spaces, we can express these notions like fairness and non-discrimination and so on, as properties and maps between the spaces, okay? And that's where the hope is that we can sort of try to formalize some of these notions. So for example, let's talk about fairness itself. Again, let's assume these are all metric spaces for now, so we can talk about distances in these spaces. And then you can talk about a mapping being fair now in a more formal way. You can say that the, if the, in a, I've, I've changed the Lipschitz condition ever so slightly from individual fairness, basically says that if the distance in the feature space, the construct feature space is small, you want the distance in the distance space also to be small. So it's a little bit strong, a little bit more general than that, but it's basically the same idea. So I can define fairness in this sort of formal way as a property of the mapping F in this ideal world. Okay? If I want to define non-discrimination, it takes a bit more work because I have to reason about how groups get distorted as I map them. So I need a bit of sort of build up to this. So Many of you are familiar with the Wasserstein distance, like the Earth mover distance, or the, you know, the, the, it has many, many, many more names to it. That's the connection that brought you into this, uh, like from computational geometry. Of course, <laughs> you, 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 you know? <laughs> Gotta have a, a nice geometric distance somewhere, right? So, exactly. yeah. Someone just asked you, could you help us with this? Exactly, no, no. that's right. <laughs> and then one thing led to another, so. Yeah. Yeah. So the, again, uh, if you're not familiar with the Wasserstein distance, maybe the best way to explain is that you have, you know, uh, the, you have two piles of mud representing property distributions in a metric space, and you want to transport the mud from, to make one pile, set of piles of mud look like the other set of piles, how much work do you have to do to do this? Right? So metric space, you can talk about work in terms of distance carry. So there's a natural way to compare subsets of a metric space. Think of it that way. So if I have uh, two sets of points, and I want to compare them, you can do this this way. Um, yes? So, I'm sorry to get stuck. No, no, that's fine. Go back. Oh, go back one slide? Sure. Yeah. So let's say I live in a fictional country where the dominant majority is all, they're all very similar to each other. Yeah. They have a very strong social code. Yeah. And the minorities come from all over and, and they're highly diverse. Yeah. There's, so then there's a, dis, there's a sort of a distributional problem, which is that I can guarantee that the dominant majority gets very consistent behavior. Mm -hmm. But the 
the minorities can get from individual to individual very disparate. And that's why this notion of fairness does not capture discrimination issues. It's not meant to. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the point. Okay. So uh, to, to, to come up with a definition for non-discrimination that again works as a function of a map between these spaces, so let's start off by defining the Wasserstein distance, like I said, and then we'll go one step further and define the Gromov Wasserstein distance, which basically is a map between metric spaces. It's a way to compare two different metric spaces. And again, roughly speaking, the way to think about this is that you are computing the Wasserstein distance between the set of all pairs of points in the two spaces. So again, you have to do it this way because you're, these are two different spaces, you can't compare them in the same space. And this is sort of a, a, sort of a standard notion that's been used to compare different metric spaces. Right, so look at how the, the distances distort when you go from one space to the other. Okay? Uh, and this is a minimization, so you want to find the best possible mapping that preserves distances. Once you have these sort of notions in your arsenal, you can now define a notion of a group skew. So you need two notions. So one is how do the groups relative to each other move? So you have groups in one space, those three blobs there, and they move. How do they move relative to each other? That capture, that's captured by this between group distance. You also want to know how groups themselves get distorted, right? So I can have groups that stay the same but move far apart, or I can have groups that get squashed in the process of moving from one space to another. The moving apart is captured by the first term, the between groups distance. The squashing is captured by the second part, the within groups distance. And then you can put them together. And I, I, I should point out that this is one way to think about this. I'm not even recommending this is the only way, but this is one way of how you might think about non-discrimination. You can look at the compare. You can compare the between group distance normalized by the within group distance. And there's a measure of group skew. And now you can say that if you want non-discrimination, you want an upper bound of group skew between the spaces. So again, it's a property of the map between the two spaces. Again, in this sort of ideal world that you can't actually see. Once you have the desirable notions, the desirable property from one side to the other, what we need are actual mechanisms, which are actually things that operate on the right side. And you can say, well, we've talked about individual fairness. We want an individual fairness mechanism is a is an individually fair mechanism, is a mapping from the observed feature space to distance space, which does not distort things very much. So again, you have two metric spaces, you want small distortion in the space. So this is a somewhat stronger notion than individual fairness, but as a mechanism, it sort of preserves structure in the space. Okay? Um, similarly, you can define a group fairness mechanism, one that collapses groups to each other. Right? So again, it's a property of a map between the feature space and distance space, it's a measurable property. And you can say, I want all the groups to be collapsed together. So I have a mapping of one group xi, a mapping of one group xj, and the Wasserstein distance between them is small. Once you have these mechanisms, which are on the right side of things you actually build, and desirable goals, which are on the left side, properties between the, the, the feature space and the distance space, what's left is what it means to go across. And this is where the worldviews come in, the worldviews that I've been sort of talking about, the beliefs. Here's what happens. We've talked about how to measure things or how to, we would like to measure things. What we don't know is how what we want to measure has been translated into the actual observations that we've got. Okay. And this is where, this is something where we have to make assumptions because we don't actually always know. If we know, then that's good, but otherwise we don't always know. One example of worldview is that what we want to measure is relatively close to what we actually want to measure. In other words, we'll call this the WYSIWYG assumption. What you see is what you get, <laughs> right? So we assume that the features you have faithfully reflect the construct space. And you can distinguish this from you know, construct feature space to the observed feature space and so on, but just for now, just assume they're both the same. Which basically means you can, again, formalize it by saying there's some function that, so the distortion is small. <coughs> so the worldview that says that what we observe is basically what's true is a statement about a map, an implicit map in between what we think, what the world should, the construct space, and the actual observation we have. This is an assumption, right? It's something we assume about the world. Similarly, um, we might assume that groups are actually indistinguishable in the construct space, and any dispute we see in the observed space is because of societal reasons. We, I've been, we've been calling this the we're all equal assumption. And again, you can formalize this by saying that in the that, that in the um, construct space, groups are actually very similar, but that they might differ when, they, when you actually observe them. And now, once you have all these arrows set up, you can now start trying to investigate whether it's possible to have compatibility. So what we would like to say is the following. We'd like to say, look, you and I might disagree on how we see the world, 
But we can all agree that we should use this particular mechanism because this mechanism just makes sense and doesn't matter what we think or don't think. And this is where it gets to be a bit difficult because this is not true anymore. And you can say this now in a more formal way because you have these ways of connecting these maps up. So specifically, suppose you thought that the world was WYSIWYG, that in fact, when you mapped your features over, things were preserved. But in fact, if you look at the picture, they're not. Right? So you made a mistaken assumption here. Right? Um, and you said, OK, well, the world is WYSIWYG. I'll use an individually fair mechanism. Because that's sort of consistent with sort of, uh, I know what I'm seeing, and I just want to make sure I have procedural fairness. What you'll end up with, not surprisingly, is something that is not, in fact, fair. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Because now you have distortions in the ideal world going, even if you assume that the decisions correctly reflect what the decisions want to be. So in other words, if you guess, if you have the wrong worldview and you apply the wrong mechanism, you will get an answer that is not um, non-discriminatory. But this works both ways. If you thought, in fact, that the world was the only observation, the only reason observations were skewed in the world is because of societal bias, that in fact groups were all equal, but they weren't. And then you decide to use a group fair mechanism to fix this problem that you imagine is happening. What you'll get something which is not fair at all. You'll be treating groups similarly when you shouldn't be. You'll be treating individuals similarly when you should not be. You'll be collapsing everything. And, so on. Okay. and the, what this is saying is that these that you cannot resolve arguments about which fairness measure to use unless you also state the worldview you're coming from. That these two things have to go together. That there is no single answer to the question which is a better uh, fairness measure to, which is why I can't give you a single measure to work with. Similar things have been done for, and we talked, we alluded to this briefly about mistreatment versus calibration. In other words, so there's a couple of very nice papers from last year that showed that if you have a non-trivial classifier, a classifier that is, you know, not sort of has a sort of trivial borderline cases, you cannot both achieve equal error rates and have essentially a version of demographic parity, qualified to some extent, unless essentially the both groups are the same. <laughs> so this, was, this came up because in the ProPublica study, what they argued was that the system that was being used to decide whether people were being uh, released on bail uh, after parole or not was, was racially biased. The company said, no, we're not racially biased. Look at our numbers. Our demographic parity is perfect. And it turned out while the demographic parity was accurate, their error rates were not. They were, the system was much more likely to detain black defendants and not give them parole versus white defendants. Again, the error rates were wrong. And so these two papers sort of came out almost at the same time, basically observing that, in fact, you can't get both things at the same time. If you want demographic parity, you will not be able to get error rate balance. If you want error rate balance, you're not going to be able to get this. Answer. Much like before, we just argue that you can't, you're not you're unlikely to get individual fairness and group fairness at the same time unless something else is happening in your system. In general, you're not going to get it. And so the challenge here, like, and so I'll, I'll bring this up sort of, you know, there's, 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 there's another paper we recently came out that sort of took our framework and explored further results that can be described under different worldviews, different hypotheses, and they sort of make various hybrid worlds that are somewhat, uh, you know, WYSIWYG and somewhat not to sort of talk about this. And the question remains, I guess, is to what other forms of worldviews are there? What other forms of definitions are there that will fit into this framework? And how we can try to come up with some kind of resolution to the issue of separating out worldviews and, and mechanisms in how we design fairness measures. So um, I'm being told that I have no minutes left, no. which is great, actually, because uh, this was a, I had an optional extra section I was going to skip to if I had time. But since we've had a good discussion, I'm happy to skip to the end. So what I, what I will do is sort of jump over the next section, <laughs> jump over my, my glasses as well. I've done worse. <laughs> so um, I will go to, let me see, let me quickly go to the end of the talk so I can just summarize with what I want to say. So I was going to, yeah, so I, it'll, 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 it's, uh, sorry, let me just uh, go to the end of my talk. Ah, good. Here we go. Okay. You could have at least clicked through or so. <laughs> and then speak very fast through them. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> as, 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 as is ask appropriate. Questions very fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, there are a number of interesting questions in, the, in sort of the larger theoretical understanding of fairness. What I just described was, was 
more of a philosophical exposition rather than a sort of a technical exposition. But there are many interesting technical questions as well. What I want to briefly go through is sort of some of these interesting technical questions very quickly and sort of tell you where sort of I feel that there's a useful contributions need to come from sort of the theory community in general and see us about this, right? So there's some, you know, we, I was talking to Vinod about this earlier, right? So can we, you know, we've always assumed that we always know what the protected groups are. We said, okay, we have this group, it's fixed, we can't change it, and so on. There's a bunch of very nice work. Uh, there's a group, uh, so this is the group of folks at Penn, Aaron Roth and others, and also Omar Rheingold and others at Harvard, looking at, can you, suppose you don't know what the protected group is, can you still define fairness over all groups that have some nice compact description? So there's, so there's a bunch of results on what you can and cannot do in that setting. It's kind of interesting. Um, there's a lot of recent work on strategic classification. Suppose you're trying to build a classifier which is fair, and adversaries are trying to beat your system by sort of changing their attributes in some way. Under what conditions can you defend against that? Um, there's a whole body of work on auditing. Can you formally make statements about the behavior of black fork model? I won't talk about that right here. Uh, but there's an interesting separate direction. This is an accountability regime. And compositionality and feedback loops. So fairness, systems that try to ensure fairness are never built by themselves. They're always part of a larger system. Usually a multiple decision-making systems hooked up together in a chain, or they're combined in some other way, or they feed back on themselves. So there's a bunch of work uh, that I and others have done on how to understand the feedback loops and how that affects fairness in the system. There's also a bunch of very nice work on how to understand compositionality. Right, so how, what happens when you take a system and, pie and daisy chain a couple of systems together, can you ensure that if a system is locally fair at every step, it's globally fair? The short answer is no. And this is kind of a disappointing sort of fact, but the question is what can you do in that case? So I just will conclude one thing. So the basic theme of what I've been trying to talk about here, and by the way, in all these papers, this holds true as well, if you look carefully, that there's a strong interplay between normative statements about fairness and justice and mathematical formalisms are the same. And um, the value of formalism, and I think there's no need to sort of preach this to this audience, is that they tell us what's possible and what's not, and can be very precise about what happens. They also encode these statements, so we have to be careful. And you know, if I ever come back again, I'll tell you about fairness in networks, which is a whole different story altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, if you plan to be in Atlanta next year, this is the second incarnation of the conference. We've, we're, like, we're, not, we're not growing as fast as deep learning, but we are growing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's kind of getting hard to keep track of literature. And with that, I will thank you for your time. I think the growth was very respectable. You just put one in front. So I think next year, it's like 76. Now it's 176. Yeah. So now it'll be 1,070. Oh, that's how you're supposed to do it. OK, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. OK. No, like, uh, uh, extrapolation. Like so extrapolation. I expect all of you to be doing helping that make that happen next time. Yes. So. Good. So do you have any like, one or two questions? I feel like oh, there wasn't there wasn't enough questions yet. So <laughs> yes. So let's say you man your dictator you managed to impose some fairness criteria. Yes. Now there's going to be a question about catching people who don't comply. Is there any work on or any consideration for sort of the sample complexity or the statistical power of testing whether people are violating fairness yeah. requirements? We, we haven't even got to the point, and I was actually talking to some people about this, we're not there yet. Yeah, Because there's a, there's, it's not just a learning problem, it's a, there's a security problem there, because you have to model the threats from the adversary. So it's, it's both a security and a sampling complexity problem, and we, I, we don't have any answers to that. But it's a, definitely a, a question we're going to have to answer soon, because we're seeing this happen now. <coughs> Facebook. <Yeah. laughs> comment, this opens up a, like another can of work. Yes, you know, like, yes. You know, because machine learning is not robust and so on. And like, yeah. yeah, and Alex can tell you more about that. So. <laughs> There was a question way in the back. I know you've been waiting for a while. So. Do you need the concept of a future contract, contract space uh, if you have like the true decisions that you should make and you just want to be accurate with respect to those decisions? You still have to predict based on something. In other words, you have some features of some kind. And you have to know those features correctly capture what you're trying. I mean, you, if you, yeah, so what you're asking is, if I have the correct decisions, is it sufficient? It's sufficient for um, certain kinds of measures. So this, this equal uh, error rate measures, it's sufficient for those if you know you have the true labels, but if you don't have. But for others, it's not. So things like demographic parity, you need to know what your features are. It also depends on what algorithms you choose to try and fix this problem. Some algorithms try to change the input. They need to understand what the features look like. Some algorithms change the output. They don't. So it depends on the algorithm, I think. That's the best answer to your question. So. Yes. Go. No, yeah. The, the person who made it is not right. Uh. 
Yeah. You want to raise your hand, right? <laughs> Um, the, so the statement is that, again, you have to, you define these things as exactly, you want exact demographic parity or you want exact uh, equal error rates. Those two things are not possible. And you can robustify them by saying if you're willing to be even a little bit approximate, you still can't do it. So there's a robust version of the statement I just mentioned there. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, some last question. Can I know what's your opinion about like recent approach of using causal inference to the fairness? Since I think it's kind of way to bridge the like construct space and observation space with some causal mechanisms. So one of my open questions is going to be sort of how do, how can you bring causality back into the discussion? There's some attempts to this now. I was talking to some uh, one of the students here who has been working on this. Ultimately, I think we do need to engage with causality at some point, but causality is a, a very hard question in and of itself, regardless of issues of fairness. But I think we, we will eventually have to, because if we want to think about interventions as opposed to predictions, which we often have to do here, then we need some kind of causal understanding to make sure our interventions are not causing more problems. So we can't avoid it. So far, we managed to. <laughs> and maybe that's a problem. OK, so let's thank Suresh again.